Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is Wisdom Wednesday, and each Wednesday I am teaching and studying the book of Proverbs. Uh, right, I've done the first 10 chapters already. They're already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So uh, I recommend you go back and watch those. But today I'm going to do uh, chapter 11. And uh, let's get started right now. Uh, I'm going to read it in the KJV and also in the Amplified. Uh, starting off with chapter 11, verse 1, it says, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. A false balance. Well, that goes back to the time when they were uh, selling products and uh, buying and selling products and they would use a balance scale to determine the weight and how much uh, uh, you know that they had to pay or they would be willing to to pay for uh, a product and a, a false balance means that it's they're being dishonest they're uh, uh, they're got the balance scale fixed so that they are going to cheat the other person so it says a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Uh, God does delight when we do the right things. And uh, when we do the wrong things, it does make him sick. It is abominable. Um, dishonesty, and cheating people, stealing from them in that way uh, certainly makes God sick. Uh, even though we're saved by grace uh, through faith alone and Christ alone, God is still happy when he sees us do good things. And I think he's sad when, and sickened by when we do bad things. Uh, let's look at that in the Amplify and see how it phrases it. Uh, a false balance and unrighteous dealings are extremely offensive and shamefully sinful to the Lord. But a just weight is his delight. Um, for many years, I was a, what to commonly known as a KJV onlyist. Uh, I wouldn't look at any other translations, uh, uh, and uh, I, I not only believed that was the right way, but I, I defended that position for many years, and, and uh, I moved away from that. Uh, and now I'm what Brother uh, Joe Byron says. Uh, uh, I'm what is it? He calls it KJV firstist. Let's look at the KJV first, but let's not be afraid to look at uh, some other translation if it's going to be helpful to us sometimes. So that's I'm mean, the amplified is my life because it amplifies, it expounds upon, it, it kind of comments on the verse. Uh, so that's what I'm doing as I'm speaking now. I'm giving you my own personal commentary on the verse, and the Amplified translation is uh, whoever uh, is the person or committee that wrote it, they basically um, put their own commentary in there in their translation. So let's look at verse 2, Proverbs 11, verse 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Pride. Uh, I know the scripture says that uh, the love of money is the root of evil. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, obviously that's true. Uh, um, the root of all evil, it says. And in, in other translations, it says it's the root of all kinds of evil. So whether it's the root of all kinds of evil or just or the root of all evil, period, uh, I'm not going to argue that point. But this pride issue, to me, is is really probably the number one issue. I mean, that's what happened with with the Satan. He got full of pride. Um, that's what got uh, Adam and Eve. They got pride. They thought, well. 
we were, we're, we can do this on our own. If we'll eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we'll be like God. You know, we'll, we'll understand good and evil. So it's prideful to think that they can be like God and they, they can be dependent, I mean, independent from God. Uh, and um, many things that we do wrong uh, today, if you really analyze it uh, and tra kind of tr trace it back, I think the root cause is pride. And uh, the reason most people I think are lost and will uh, go into the lake of fire and suffer the second death is, is because of pride. They, they think that they don't need Jesus. They think that they can do it on their own. Uh, they can live a good life. They can uh, uh, be a moral person. They can follow commandments. Uh, they can follow the golden rule, or they can be good enough. They're full of pride, and, and they think that uh, Jesus is not necessary. Or if even if Jesus is necessary, you know, he, he can't do it all. I, I've got to do my part. And, and what salvation is based upon is uh, the, uh, contrary to that. It is, is based on humility. We, we need to come to the understanding that we can do it, and we, we are... We are not capable, and that's humility. When you when you say, "I need God to save me," His name is Jesus Christ. I need Jesus Christ to save me. So this question of pride in in the uh, uh, the book of Proverbs, uh, I've mentioned this in many of the previous studies, but the book of Proverbs is King Solomon uh, teaching his son wisdom. And there are certain themes that are recurring. And uh, we, we've talked in the past about the temptations of, a, of women, uh, to the temptations of bad friends to lead you into, you know, uh, doing bad things, getting into trouble. Uh, the temptation of, uh, of uh, you know, just to be lazy and, and not, not have a good work ethic. So um, the, the strange woman, the uh, laziness, now pride, all these things uh, continue to come back into the subject of um, the book of Proverbs and because we want to learn to be wise. And why do we want to be wise? We don't go to heaven because we're wise. Uh, but, but if we're wise and we do the right things, we get good results in our lives. And our lives will be more prosperous more blessed, will be healthier and happier. So there is a great uh, value in learning wisdom. And that's what we're going to get from this study of Proverbs. Uh, now let's look at verse 2 in the Amplified. Uh, when swelling and pride come, then emptiness and shame come also. But with the humble, those who are lowly, who have been pruned and or chiseled by trial and renounce self are a skillful and godly wisdom and soundness. Yeah. Uh, I've talked in the past about this word self. Uh, uh, if a person is self-centered, uh, they're, they're going to have all kinds of problems. Um, first of all, they they will not go to heaven because if, if they are self-centered, they're uh, they're not uh, Christ-centered. We should be we should be relying on Christ instead of relying on self. That's so you don't want to be self-reliant. You want to rely on Christ. You you want you don't want to be self-righteous, thinking that you're good. You have to be humble and say. I need the righteousness of Christ imputed to me. Uh, you don't want to be self-confident, believing in yourself and your own ability. You want to uh, put your confidence in Jesus Christ instead. So uh, all these things are uh, uh, based upon self. We need to stop being self-centered and be Christ-centered. And that's what this uh, Amplified Version is emphasizing here, the idea of renouncing yourself. And that's the difference between pride and humility. Okay, let's look at verse 3 in the KJV. The integrity of the upright 
shall guide them. But the perseverance, per perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. So we have a contrast between integrity and perverseness. Uh, obviously, um, having integrity uh, means that you, you are honest and you are applying that honesty by doing the right things. That's integrity. Uh, and then perverseness and being a transgressor, what you get out of that is destruction. Uh, not only are, is your life destroyed because you're going to suffer all the consequences of these transgressions, but uh, you'll also be destroyed in the lake of fire on the second death uh, if you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you are full of pride and, and perverseness. And, um, let's look at verse 3 in the Amplified now. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the willful contrariness and crookedness of the treacherous shall destroy them. I mean, a lot of people think that they they can do crooked deals and, and uh, do, do, do these kinds of things, and it's going to benefit them. And sometimes in the short run, it does. Um, but eventually, uh, they, they will suffer the consequences. Sometimes the consequences are the law catches them. Uh, and they end up being imprisoned. Uh, sometimes the consequence is their victim will not be victimized. And if a victim fights back and harm hurts them and their plan backfires. And uh, sometimes their consequence is, uh, is uh, not in this lifetime, but uh, after this lifetime, the consequence of, of the, this kind of an attitude. This kind of attitude is the fruit of not being uh, indwelled with the Holy Spirit. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, he has his spirit come into us and live in us. And the Holy Spirit starts transforming us changing our attitudes, our, the way we think and the way we act. And some of us um, listen to the Holy Spirit and want to respond and want to grow and mature spiritually. And, and but sometimes people, though, instead of listening to the Holy Spirit, we, we push it away. We try to tune it out. Uh, uh, scripture talks about uh, grieving the Spirit. We're not listening to the Holy Spirit trying to transform us. Um, and if we grieve the Spirit long enough, the Scripture says that we will even quench the Spirit, where you don't even hear the Holy Spirit's promptings anymore. But when a person has the Holy Spirit because of their faith in Jesus, then you you end up um, getting transformed, and and your your attitudes, your thoughts, and your and your actions uh, change a lot. Now, um, so let integrity uh, guide you. And let's look at verse uh, 3 in the Amplified. Oh, I already did that. Let's look at verse 4 in the KJV. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. Riches profit not in the day of wrath. Well, in the day of wrath, um, this could very well have an implication to uh, after the afterlife. And that is the the wrath of God, which is uh, uh, people have to suffer the wrath of God after they die. If they go to the great white throne judgment, that's where people go 
who never put their faith in Jesus and they want to go up and plead their case based upon how good they are and, and uh, you know, find out that in the eyes of God, uh, Scripture says that the righteousness of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So even though you're full of pride and you think you're good and you think you can plead your case to God, say, oh, I'm good enough. Look at me. I deserve heaven. <clears throat> God's going to just, um, he's not going to accept your filthy rags. And uh, so it will, you, you can be rich because of your scheming and conniving and thievery and unbalanced uh, scales and, uh, in this life. And maybe you can get away with it for, to a certain extent. But in the end, uh, the wrath of God will fall upon you. And you will be found that uh, you, you did not have the righteousness you thought you had. You needed the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it says in the end of that, but the righteousness, but righteousness delivereth from death. Not our own righteousness, because our own righteousness is insufficient. Uh, you know, if you want to compare yourself to other people, um, you can find some people uh, that are, you can say, well, I'm not like that person. It's like the Pharisee that was praying and saying, oh, God, thank you. I'm so thankful that I'm not like these other people. You know, I tithe and I fast and I do all these good things. I'm glad I'm not like these other people. You can always find some other people you can compare yourself with and, and you can think that you're better than them. Uh, but uh, the one that Jesus said was justified that day is not the Pharisee that claimed he was better. It was boasting to God. It was the, um, the, the tax collector who was just on his face, wouldn't even look, look up his eyes to God and, and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That was humility. That was appealing to God. That was admitting to God that he was unworthy. He was unrighteous. And he needed God's mercy and forgiveness and salvation. So um, the, the righteousness that delivers us from death, uh, the second death, is uh, is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we receive that when we put our faith in him, no longer having faith in ourselves. But the righteousness that delivers from death in this life is, hey, you're much less likely uh, to uh, get killed uh, in, in some criminal activities if, if you're not hanging out with the wrong people, if you're not con uh, pursuing you know, bad activity, criminal activities. If you're being a good citizen, if you're doing the right thing, if you say, says uh, the integrity of the upright shall guide them. So if you let it, if your actions are guided by integrity, then it's far less likely. I mean, it's far more likely that um, you're not going to suffer some uh, untimely death in this life. You know, there are, are sometimes there are innocent victims that. But no fault of their own, they were not doing the wrong things. They're just at the wrong place at the wrong time, and, and they s suffered an early death. Let's look at verse 4 in the Amplified. It says, Riches provide no security at any day of wrath and judgment, but righteousness that's uprightness and right standing with God, delivers from death. Yeah, your, your riches are not going to be any good uh, when it comes to God's judgment. Let's look at verse 5 in the KJV. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. And, uh, but the, the wicked shall fall on his own wickedness. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. Well, Jesus said, uh, go and be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And Jesus uh, said a lot of things that were basically impossible for us to do. 
the, the rich young ruler asked Jesus what he has to do to get in the kingdom. And he said, Jesus will get, follow the commandments. And he said, I've done them all since my youth. And he said, well, then go and sell everything you want and give it to the poor. And the rich young ruler, you know, he, he had a lot of wealth and he, he didn't, he wasn't willing to do that. Now, in, in reality, Jesus doesn't expect us to sell everything we own and give it to the poor in order to go to heaven. But he, he wanted to pop the bubble, uh, the, the delusion that the rich young ruler was under. And that was that, that he was good. He's followed all the commandments. And see, uh, scriptures tell us that we must, if we want to get to heaven through law, through legalism, through a personal merit, then, then the standard we've got to meet is perfection. He said, go and be perfect, as my Father in heaven is perfect. And uh, so the, the rich young ruler wasn't perfect, but he, Jesus had to illustrate to him, hey, you're not perfect. Are you willing to sell everything you want to give it to the poor? Uh, and Jesus' apostles asked him, he said, well, Jesus said, it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And his, his apostles said, well, Lord, if that's the case, how, how is it possible for, how can anyone be saved? That's a good question. How can anyone be saved? <laughs> Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. That's the first thing we need to understand. It is impossible to get to heaven through personal merit, through our own efforts. That's the first thing you understand. But then Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. So stop trying to, to get to heaven through your own efforts because the standard is perfection. We need to be humble, admit, no, I can't reach that standard. Only Jesus Christ had, had meets the standard of perfection. We all fall short of this standard. We all fall short of the glory of God. I hear someone there. Let me see. Let me see. Very good, brother. <laughs> hey, brother, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm I'm blessed uh, far beyond anything I ever deserve. How about you? Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah, I'm glad to see you again. It's been a while. You've been busy you know, entertaining your wife, huh? Oh uh, yeah, we're still remodeling. Got yeah. a lot of work to do. That's good. Have you uh, listened to anything I've said so far? I've been doing it on for about a half an hour already. Oh, no, I'm late. Okay. You know, I, I started early today because I have to end early because uh, I have to go somewhere. But uh, I'm on Proverbs chapter 11, and the verse I'm on is um, uh, verse 5. And it says, the righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. And I was talking about this word perfect, and that uh, if, if man uh, is trying to get to heaven through their own effort, then the standard they must meet is perfection. And we need to all uh, come to the conclusion that this is hopeless. We cannot ever reach the level of perfection that's required. Jesus said it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So we need to put our faith in God, and this God that saves us is Jesus Christ. So can you take a look at Proverbs 11, verse uh, 5? The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm also reading it in the Amplified, so let me go to that now. Uh, the righteous of the blameless shall rectify. Now, we know that no one is really perfect or blameless. Um, uh, the only time we re reach that status in the eyes of God is when we are part of our faith in Je Jesus, and then, and then God sees us as perfect as Jesus. But without the righteousness of Jesus, then this uh, status of being blameless is impossible. 
uh, and it says, uh, and make plain their way and keep it straight, but the wicked shall fall by their own wickedness. Um, well, the, the results of being wicked are twofold. One, of course, is uh, the consequences that people suffer in this life from their wickedness. Uh, and then the other, of course, is that uh, uh, after this life, we have the judgment. And uh, if, if people are wicked, uh, I'm assuming that they never put their faith in, in Jesus. So then they're going to suffer other consequences, which is the, the judgment, the, uh, the second death in the lake of fire. So do you have anything to say about that, brother? I agree. Uh, absolutely. A hundred percent. It's all about Jesus. Every, every word, every sentence. It's talking about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to go to, uh, I'm looking at KJV and Amplified. But, uh, I'm going to verse 6 now. It says, the righteousness of the upright shall deliver them but transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. <laughs> How do you like that, the way that's phrased? Yeah, well, that's absolutely uh, accurate. Very well put. Yeah, I like that word naughtiness. You don't hear that very often, uh, except when you're talking to little children to tell them, don't be naughty, you know? Yeah. Uh-huh. We can't have no naughtiness in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Well, uh, I'd say that in verse 6, the first part, the righteousness of the upright shall deliver them. Well, uh, uh, that's true in, in two, in two uh, ways. Uh, uh, in, in our lifetime, uh, if, if we're doing the right things, we will uh, be delivered from bad consequences. We're, we're going to end up getting according to the law of reaping and sowing, you know, if we're doing the right things, we're going to get good results in our lives. But, uh, and then it also has a twofold, and that is after this life, uh, the righteous of the right shall deliver them. Well, we'll be delivered from the judgment because of righteousness. But we cannot be delivered from the judgment of God uh, through our own righteousness, because our own righteousness, as I said, is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So the only righteousness that will deliver us from the judgment is the righteousness we get when we put our faith in Jesus. Yeah. And I think that's... Amen to that. Okay. And it says, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. Uh, yeah, it's just, you know, if, if you are wicked, if you're doing wicked things, uh, then don't expect to just go your entire life and never get uh, caught, never get consequences. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes you get caught by the police and you go to jail. Sometimes you get uh, your plan backfires and your, your, attended, your intended victim gets you. And, and, and then... Uh, so, and we know that uh, there are consequences in, in the judgment, too. If a person never put their faith in Jesus, then uh, they're going to be uh, suffer the second death in the lake of fire. Um, I'm going to look at this in the Amplified. Let's verse 6 and see. The righteousness of the upright, their rectitude in every area and relation shall deliver them. But the treacherousness the treacherous shall be taken in their own iniquity and greedy desire. Yeah. Well, we've got, uh, I, I see a twofold message in, in, in this whole chapter, uh, every, every verse so far, I've seen a twofold application here. And one is uh, the application to our current lives. And the other uh, is the application of, uh, after this life is over, and we, 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 we will either go to the great white throne judgment because we never put our faith in Jesus, and then we have the consequences of uh, no faith in Jesus, so we go into the lake of fire for the, for the second death, or we go to the great white throne, the, uh, the judgment seat of Christ, where all those people put, who put their faith in Jesus, we're deemed and judged righteous. 
and, and uh, not guilty. Uh, and, and we have eternal life because of our faith in Jesus. So um, I just think it's important for people to not think that they, uh, by their own good conduct in this life, somehow they're going to go to heaven. Hmm. Well, they're not going to hear it from us. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> they're going to get the real pure gospel from us, not some kind of legalistic uh, philosophy. Uh, verse 7, when a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of unjust men perisheth. Okay. Uh, well, a lot of interesting things in there, a lot of key words that, uh, that I'd like. Let me ask you to respond to that first instead of me always being the first to uh, comment. Anything okay. Verse 7. Okay, when a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of unjust men perisheth. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, no hope. Mm -hmm. If you're not in Christ, you ain't got no hope, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. Uh, again, if I continue on with the uh, twofold theme here, uh, the, the application of these verses in our regular life, and then the application of these verses in uh, the uh, afterlife. Uh, we, when a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish. Um, well, uh, I, I don't know how you see it, brother, but I, I have a playlist talking about eternal torment versus eternal death. And I, be, I believe that uh, in, when a person is judged and found lacking eternal life, because they never put their faith in Jesus, they go to the lake of fire for the second death, and they die at the second death. They do not live there and be tormented forever and ever and ever, and God is going to be cruel, <laughs> statistically torturing them. I believe the word perish means perish. And of course, in John 3.16, we see that there's a, um, a the, the, the options, the two options are, uh, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we have, we have the two options are you can either perish or you can have life everlasting. Uh, and uh, I see that also in uh, Romans 6.23, it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the two options a person has there is, you can have death, or you can have eternal life through faith in Jesus. Uh, I don't see the options as uh, we can we can have life everlasting in heaven, or you can go suffer forever in hell. Uh, but that's another subject. I don't want to go great deeply into that. But to me, these key words kind of set me off, because when I see the word perish, it says right here in verse 7, when it... Uh, when a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish. Uh, I, I think that's it. Uh, you know, you're going to go to the judgment. You're going to be uh, found uh, uh, mortal. Uh, you never received eternal life from Jesus. You never put your faith in him. You're mortal. You're, you're, you're doomed to die. And you go into that lake of fire and you, are, you perish there. But then the rest of us is in the hope of the unjust men shall perish. Unjust, of course is a, a person is unjustified. Uh, you're, we're only justified in God's sight uh, by our faith in Jesus. Uh, so, um, in other words, um, if someone asked, asked me, if God asked me, why should I let you into heaven? What justifies you going to heaven? I would say, God, I, the only justification for me is Jesus Christ. I, I'm, I'm totally unworthy on my own, but my, I have faith in Jesus. That's the only justification I can give you. That's the only plea I can make. And so we're only really found just or justified when we put our faith in Jesus. And without that, then according to the end of this verse, it says the unjust man will perish. 
All right. I said a lot, brother. What's your response to that? Well, I uh, agree with you that uh, Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. And Jesus is all about saving the flesh as well as saving the soul. So uh, that's why we've got this big book of uh, uh, admonitions to uh, help us uh, attain not only salvation of our souls, but salvation of our flesh. Uh, okay. Okay, I'm going to look at verse 7 in the Amplified now. It says, when the wicked man dies, his hope for the future perishes. Uh, and the expectation of the godless comes to nothing. Uh, so here, you know, again, this is, uh, this, I did a lengthy, lengthy uh, s study on, on this uh, subject of eternal torment or, or, or uh, eternal death. And, and uh, there's so many verses. There's probably a hundred verses that talk about the same kind of thing. The wicked man perishes. And then here it says, the wicked man dies. His hope, for, it says in Amplified, his hope for the future perishes. And the expectation of the godless comes to nothing. So to me, that, that supports my, my uh, position on annihilationism, where the, uh, the, there, there's, there's not one verse in the Bible that says that man innately has an immortal soul. Now, people make the mistake of thinking that every person is born with an immortal soul. But I challenge anybody, show me a verse that says man is, has, an, has an immortal soul. And, and it's, there's, there's, there is a verse that says man is mortal, has a mortal soul, but not immortal soul. And there's another verse that says that uh, we put on, we're mortal, but we put on immortality when we believe in Jesus. So the only way our soul becomes immortal is when we put our faith in Jesus. Uh, so um, this uh, idea of comes to nothing, uh, well, that's, that's how I see it. That a person, uh, uh, if they never put their faith in Jesus, they're just mere mortals. They're going to be judged, and then they're going to die, and then everything comes to nothing. Uh, whereas if they choose to put their faith in Jesus, they, they are no longer mortal, but they receive immortality. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to having fellowship with you throughout all of eternity, brother. And uh, and we'll probably never get bored either. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? No, there's no boredom in uh, heaven, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I to me, my attitude about a lot of things in life have changed. Uh, over the years since I was born again, and uh, my interests are different. The things I want to spend my time doing, like right now, I'm um, I, I'm not ha having this conversation with you out of some kind of obligation or duty. Or uh, I'm here because I, f through free will, choose to put my spend my time doing this because it's a it's a pleasure. Um, studying the scriptures, talking about Jesus, talking about the Bible, having a fellowship with another believer is a great pleasure that I really look forward to. And learning, and as we discuss the scriptures, I learn from you. Maybe you can learn from me. But I, I'm continuing to learning, learning about the scriptures and about the way God thinks and his plans for us. That is exciting. And we're going to continue in eternity. I did a 50 hour teaching on the subject of heaven. <laughs> it was 25 sessions, two hours each, and it was all about heaven. And, and the idea, of course, one of the main things we got out of it is how exciting it's going to be. As you said, we're never going to get bored in heaven, as you said. Uh, amen to that. Okay, I've yet to watch your uh, 50 hour study on uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite a lot to take on, brother, I'll tell you. you. I don't know if you'll ever get around to it, but uh, it was a lot of fun doing it. Let me just say that. 
Okay, I'm going to go to verse 8 now. In the, uh, the KJV says, the righteous, the righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. The righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. Let me look at that in the KJ and the Amplified. Uh, the, the uncompromisingly righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked gets into it instead. <laughs> uh, well, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, why is it you think the righteous... Uh, Escape from trouble. Well, it happened to me. Uh, it happens to me all the time. Uh, my last couple jobs I had, uh, uh, my enemy set a snare for me, and it did cost me my job twice, but uh, their uh, repercussions were much greater than uh, what what they meant for evil, God meant for good for me. But uh, it didn't go well for them, unfortunately. And, in, and that's just uh, one of the ways that God has designed uh, the spiritual world. And uh, thank God for it. Yeah, we... Uh... Uh, the um, yeah, that's one example. You, you, I'm sure you can give a lot of examples as you if you reflect on your life uh, that are like that. Um, it doesn't mean that you know. Uh, by the way, uh, when we're, we're um, I asked you the question uh, based on the uh, premise that you are righteous because you're righteous. You escape these problems, but the person who's wicked, they uh, they don't escape the problems. But uh, so I, I ask you a question because uh, we were uh, stating that yes, you are righteous, and, and because of that, you get uh, you, know, you escape from trouble. Now it doesn't mean that um, when we're righteous in terms of we're doing the right things uh, that we're that we're going to always escape because uh, you know sometimes bad things happen to good people. And, and that's, that's something that we have to live with and try to cope with and try to understand. Uh, but uh, generally, it is true that if we're doing the right things, we're going to get the right results back in our lives. If we're doing the wrong things or wicked things, then we're going to end up with bad things. We're going to, we're going to get sick from, from taking drugs. We're addicted. We're going to, we're going to uh, get, go to jail for criminal activities. We're going, to be, we're going to be shot and killed because we slept with someone's wife and he hunted us down and killed us. These are the kinds of things. You do the wrong things, and then you get the, the bad things as a result of it. So uh, you, you are righteous, brother, in two ways. One is that the actions you take right now are, are judged either righteous or not. And, and because the Holy Spirit is directing you, most of the time you listen to the Spirit and you're doing the right thing. You're right, you're, we judge your activities as righteous. But you're also righteous in the respect that you have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ when you put your faith in him. All right, let's see. Uh, that's where, that was verse 10. No, that wasn't verse 10. That was verse, uh, that's verse 8. Let's go to verse 9 in the KJV here. A, a hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Wow. A hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. Well, I'll let you respond first to this verse 9 if you want. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's, that's a familiar, very familiar to me. Uh, when people gossip and tell, say lies about you, uh, it could really harm your reputation. And uh, the enemy did that to me. 
but uh, stand firm in the Lord, and uh, he will deliver you, because God delivers us out of all of our troubles. Mm -hmm. And yeah, through knowledge shall the just be delivered, and knowledge one is one of the avenues that God gives us to uh, overcome uh, our enemies when they come against us in this manner. Mm -hmm. Have you ever noticed that, uh, you know, uh, when we when we study the activities and the words of Jesus in the scriptures, that uh, how how graceful he was, gracious and and kind to all the sinners, uh, but he we got quite angry with uh, with uh, the religious, the extremely religious people. And, and he called them hypocrites. Uh, he, uh, it seems to me that uh, he was very understanding about everything except for this religious hypocrisy. That really, that really got his uh, you know, righteous indignation going. Oh, yes, very much so. Uh, and, and for us, that would be the work salvationists and the... And the money changers are the the phonies that are in it for a buck. Mm -hmm. Okay, but as long as they preach the true gospel, I don't care if they're making uh, surplus funds from uh, preaching the true gospel. But most of the time, you'll find that they're preaching a false gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I don't know if you've ever uh, really considered the word hypocrite or hypocrisy very, uh, very much, but uh, uh, there was a man... I don't know what, when he lived, but his name was Hippocrates. There's actually two Hippocrates. One of them is a, is a man known for the Hippocratic Oath that was uh, uh, the doctors take. But this is another Hippocrates who, who was a famous actor from centuries and many centuries ago. And uh, from his name, the word Hippocrates, we get the word hypocrite. And the word hypocrite means actor. Uh, it means that you're acting like someone else when it's not really you. And that's hypocrisy. That's a hypocrite. Uh, that's what actors do. If you're in a theater or acting in the movie or something, you're acting like you're someone else. It's not really you. And so uh, uh, this hypocrisy, of course, it really is upsetting to Jesus. And that's when a person is pretending to be somebody they're not. Um, so um, I'm going to look at it in the Amplified. Do you want to say anything about that before I move on to the Amplified, verse 9? No, verse, let me see, yeah, verse 9. Okay, yeah, i just like to say that uh, I know I go around pretending I'm the Lone Ranger sometimes. <laughs> 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 I, love but the, the, I loved your little opening song there when you joined. It was fun. <laughs> okay, but the truth is, Jesus is the Lone Ranger, and he gave us access to all of uh, his uh, uh, office. He told us to occupy till he comes back. And so I'm just uh, holding down the fort till he comes back. Yeah, very good. Um, let me see, you got uh, verse 9 in the Amplified says, With his mouth the godless man destroys his neighbor. With his mouth, it says. And it says, But through knowledge and superior discernment shall the righteous be delivered. Uh, so uh, this Amplified refers to this hypocrite as uh, someone uh, with the mouth the god as a godless man. Um, a godless man, or you're... Now, even people who think that they're not godless, that they, they believe in God and, and they're, uh, uh, they're very religious, um, and, and yet uh, they don't really have God because you, you only have God uh, when you put your faith in Jesus, then the Holy Spirit of God comes into you. Then you, you're not godless. You have God because God is inside you. Uh, many people, the world has so many fallacies that are wrong. One is personal merit, thinking that they get, you can, people can work their way to heaven. 
another is that everybody has an immortal soul, and after they die, they got to live somewhere forever. So they either live in heaven forever or live in hell forever. Ever, and then you got this uh, idea of, of that everybody is a child of God, or everybody has God inside them. But we don't have God inside us. We were born with a dead spirit, the scriptures tell us. And the only way our spirit comes alive is regenerated or quickened uh, is when we're born again with our faith in Jesus. And that's when the Holy Spirit comes. And here's our spirit. Here's the Holy Spirit. And we get connected to God, to the Holy Spirit in us. And it regenerates us and brings our spirit alive. And then we're no longer godless. I'm not godless because God is in me. But those people who never put their faith in Jesus are godless, even though they might find that very insulting. If they don't have Jesus, uh, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have God in them. Uh, absolutely. It's an actual, uh, real, it's actually really a real event. It's a real event, the new birth, when you get born again. It's not just something in your imagination. It, it really happens. There's a, a real regeneration of new life inside of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the end of that verse, it says, But through knowledge and superior discernment shall the righteous be delivered. Uh, knowledge and superior discernment is very, very uh, important for us to have that. What do you, how do you take that? Well, uh, that was verse seven. Verse nine. Ah. Oh. Oh. It's the amplified though. Okay. The well, second, the, verse nine. Uh, and what was, what was the second, what was it? And then in verse nine, the second half says, uh, is the whole thing is with his mouth the godless man destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge and superior discernment shall the righteous be delivered. Okay, yeah, I don't know where they get those extra uh, phrases, uh, but uh, maybe they're helpful, huh? Yeah, it's. Um, I, I made a comment earlier. The reason that I'm I'm using the KJV first is because I. I'm a KJV firstist. I always want to look at it first. Yeah, but the reason I look at the Amplified is because the Amplified translation is of exactly what it says it is. It amplifies the scriptures. It expounds. It, it comments on it. And just as you and I right now, when we read a verse in the KJV, I say, what do you think? And you're amplifying. You're commenting on it. Well, these writers of the Amplified Version have done just what we're doing. They read the verse, and then they amplify it and put their own interpretation to it, and which can be helpful to us. Uh, but we have to look at the KJV first because it's just pure scripture, and the Amplified is scripture plus their own commentary to help us understand. Okay, I got it. So uh, I'm gonna amplify my own amplification on number nine, the second half. Okay. But, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Uh, that would be number one, through faith in Jesus Christ. And number two, by keeping the royal law of love, we can't fail. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I know what the royal law of love is. I'm wondering if maybe some of the viewers don't know what you mean. But it, how, how would you define that, the royal law of love? Okay, I am certain that uh, very few people know about the royal law of love, but James himself said it. He mentioned specifically that if you keep the royal law of love, you shall do well. And we all know that uh, the royal law of love was instituted in the upper room when Jesus said, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. There it is. And it's not a new, uh, James says it's not, or John says it's not a new commandment, but it's one that they had from the beginning. Mm -hmm. They always had that one commandment. Okay. All my lawyers have approved uh, my uh, views on this subject. 
<laughs> yeah, very good. Well, I would add that uh, uh, Jesus uh, said that he was he was condensing all the laws into just one law, and that is this love, law of love, and that is. We love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbor as ourselves. And he said, uh, he says that uh, there's only one thing that he's really requiring us to do, and to to love each other. So uh, everything could be be condensed and simplified in this what what's called the royal law of love, as you said. And so when you look at verse nine, it says through through knowledge and superior discernment. Uh, so when we apply this royal law uh, of uh, love, and, and that's the way we conduct ourselves, then we're, pr we're probably going to get pretty good results out of our life. You know, if we're a loving person and we're going to be, if, we're love, if we love pe people, we're not going to cheat them. If we love people, we're not going to physically injure them. If we love people, we're not going to gossip about them, and, and so on and so on. Because love uh, is nothing but positive comes from love. And then by, by conducting ourselves and living our lives according to that commandment that Jesus gave us, then uh, we're going to be delivered from all kinds of problems in life. Now, let's look at verse 10 in uh, KJV now. It says, when it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoiceth. And when the wicked perish, there is shouting. <laughs> oh, man. When it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoiceth. Well, I would be hope that's true. I'm, I'm afraid at this, this point in history and, and in our country, uh, people are rejoicing more about unrighteous things than, than they're, you know, righteous doing well. Uh, I see all kinds of celebrations in America today over things that uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, that, that God would not be happy with. The scriptures specifically tell us, don't do that. And then uh, people are having parades and celebrations and everything over people doing the, the wrong things. So I, it's unfortunate, but according to this scripture, when it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoiceth. Amen to that. Now, uh, we haven't spoke much about the queers <laughs> and the sodomites, but uh, we'll get plenty of chances to do that, and we'll be able to uh, uh, relay our uh, views uh how we feel about them uh we love them and we want them to come to christ to believe the gospel that jesus christ died for our sins and he rose again on and he was buried and rose again on the third day according to scriptures so that they can win the battle for their souls and then they can start walking in uh love and uh save their flesh uh, as well uh until then uh there's really no much not much hope for them uh, so, uh, that's where we stand on, uh, the folks. And the, uh, the end of the tip, verse 10, it says, and, and when the wicked perish, there is shouting, uh, there's cel celebration over the wicked perishing. Um, there's certain verses in the Bible that, uh, that make me like this one that, uh, make us think that, uh, being happy, like uh, what I see what's happening in the country now and the leadership we have in the country, what, what is being done, uh, I, I don't want to go so far as like, you know, Pastor Stephen Anderson, he, he, he's famous for praying for President Obama to die and, or, and, and uh, stuff like that. And it, uh, I, I can't bring myself to do that, but... Um, when I see uh, these wicked things happening, uh, if if uh, it were to stop for some reason, whether whether there was a death or whether there was some kind of a change that happened, I would celebrate that. But uh, I know the scriptures tell us that you know, yeah, we can celebrate when the wicked perish. Uh, I just have a hard time. Uh, 
uh, like you know praying for wicked people to perish. I don't know. Maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm not uh, looking at it right. What do you think? Uh, I am in agreement with you. Uh, you know, I don't really come against uh, Obama or the Muslim nation or the Mormons because uh, I don't really I don't take on a fight that I can't finish. And uh, uh, someday, sometime, uh, there'll be a time to stand up against uh, those people. Uh, well, you know, we, we can't just sit there and uh, turn, our, turn away uh, when they're doing evil. You know what I mean? Uh, we got to stand up for what's right. But uh, th there's a point that we shouldn't go beyond. Now, I love Obama, and I want him to get saved, repent, and uh, believe the gospel and uh do what's right and uh, i love the queers i want them to do the same i love the muslims i want them all to believe the gospel and get saved and and it's gonna make i'm gonna make sure that they hear the gospel uh be, they all need a chance to hear the gospel and once that's done uh then we can go ahead and fight it out if they want mm -hmm. because that's what we're gonna end up doing anyways yeah Okay, I'm going to look at this verse 10 in the Amplified. See if it says, uh, uh, when it goes well with the uncompromisingly righteous, the city rejoices. Uh, but when the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. Yeah, and that, and that's, let me look at that, the King James again. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I wish that was the case. I, I, unfortunately, I, I think that kind of the world's turned upside down right now, or not the world, but at least America, we're kind of turned upside down. And uh, when it, it says, when it goes well with the uncompromising righteous, the city rejoices. But I'm not sure I'm seeing the rejoicing. I'm seeing the rejoicing for the wrong things. And, and when the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. Uh, I'm seeing sometimes the wicked perish, and we, we seem to be taking the sides of the wicked. And, 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 and instead of in, uh, like this, uh, they're all concerned about this uh, illegal immigrant that shot this young woman recently. And people are all concerned about uh, the, the, what they say are the rights of these illegal immigrants. Uh, and uh, in, instead of being more concerned about the death of this innocent young woman who was killed by this illegal immigrant. It just seems like our values are flipped around backwards right now. Okay. Yes, uh, you're right. Uh, the world's gone mad. And I believe it's because we haven't uh, got the gospel out to them. And we need to get the pure and simple message of the gospel out to them and not this phony uh, works gospel, which can't save and not some, uh, Oh, I think that's the main problem. Uh, is the is the the false gospels is uh, keeping us from getting the true gospel out there, which can is the only solution and only salvation for the world, and mm -hmm. and we we're facing all these problems now because we let these false gospel preachers uh, get in there and uh, ruin it for everybody, mm -hmm. and that's why the queers have gone wild, and that's why the Muslims have gone wild. It's because we didn't take the authority and deal with the false gospel preachers. Uh, and now we got to deal with all this other crap. Yeah. Well, those days are ended. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, go to verse uh, 11 in the KJV. It says, by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, uh, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. Hmm. Yeah. Well, let me see it in KJV. I mean, in the Amplified, eleven, verse eleven. By the blessing of the influence of the upright and God's favor, because of them, the city is exalted. Uh, but I'm, what I'm seeing is the, the this these people. This is referring to uh, the upright. Uh, the upright, the, the, the saved people, uh, because of because of the influence of them, the city is exalted. Uh, 
but I'm I'm just not seeing enough people that uh, and it just seems like the vast vast majority of society is is not in that category. Well, let me ask you, brother, what do you, what do you think um, in America and then in the world as a whole? Uh, what percentage of people do you think are what we would call truly saved because of faith alone in Christ alone? What percentage of people do you think uh, fit that category? Uh, it's one out of ten. I believe Scripture uh, has secretly revealed that one out of ten are true believers. Uh, I've tried to calculate it on my own, and uh, but I, I'm curious now. I've never heard anybody say that uh, scriptures revealed it. Which could you tell me how? If, if it's if it's not too difficult, I believe that when Jesus said, "Where are the nine? Uh, he was referring to the principle of the tithe, and the tithe being the the first fruits of uh, the resurrection of the dead, uh, which is are all who are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, <coughs> uh, I've. Uh, I've always calculated it to be uh, even less than that. Uh, because if we look at uh, just the, uh, the, the population of the world, they say about, let me see, I've got numbers right here in front of me here. Uh, it says uh, in Christendom, under, under Christendom, uh, that's the people who uh, are labeled as Christian, that identify themselves as Christian of some kind. Uh, this Christendom is 2.2 billion in the world. Um, now, um, so 2.2 billion out of uh, 6 billion is, uh, let's say, roughly one-third, okay? Um, and then from that, uh, the 2.2 billion, we have 1.2 billion are Roman Catholics, of which 99.9999% are not saved, in my opinion. Because they, um, if you ask any Roman Catholic, uh, do, you, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? A Roman Catholic every time tells me, well, I'm not sure I'm going to go to heaven. I think I am. I hope I am. But I'm not sure. And the reason is that I attend church and I confess to the priest and I take communion and I do this and I do that and I follow the commandments. They try to justify their salvation on their own merit. And uh, no, not one Roman Catholic, if you ask him the question, is gonna say, uh, I'm, yes, I'm gonna go to heaven because Jesus is my savior and for no other reason. I'm justified because of Jesus, not because of myself. Um, for that reason, Almost all Roman Catholics, I would eliminate from this. So we kept that down now to from 2.2 billion to, to 1 billion. Now, out of the rest of the people that are, call themselves Christians, that are not Roman Catholic, uh, what percentage of that, that pe pe those people are uh, uh, believe in faith alone that are not lordship salvationists? Uh, I'd say that probably... Uh, at least uh, uh, probably 80% of those are lordship. Most people don't believe in faith alone. They believe in some kind of works to either get saved or stay saved or prove you're saved. So that gets us down to, uh, let's say, from 1 billion, let's say that there's 10% uh, of those. Uh, that, that would give us um, 100, 100 million. So a hundred million, uh, one tenth of a billion. Uh, so, so, so what's a hundred million out of six billion? A hundred million, uh, one sixtieth, right? So that gets us down to less than two percent. Okay, that's bad news. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, I, I've just calculated like that over the years, and uh, I mean, I think that, uh, um, that that's why when we look at these verses here that we're studying, uh, it says that, uh, Uh, when it goes well with the uncompromisingly righteous, the city rejoices. But when the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. Um, these uncompromisingly righteous. Now, the righteousness that gets us to sal salvation 
is um, is faith in Jesus, and and uh, there are so few. There are so few. That's why I don't see the city rejoicing, you know, because because they're only rejoicing in bad things. They're rejoicing in, in gay marriage. They're rejoicing in uh, uh, all these things that in, in uh, uh, you know, I'm not calling um, um, Islam, Islam what it really is uh, in, in saying that it's uh, um, uh, the, the common belief is that the vast majority of Muslims are, you know, are not violent and not don't want to have this holy war and kill people. And yet I saw polls uh, done in the Middle East a few months ago, and they asked the question uh, in countries all over the Middle East. They said, uh, do, you, do you think it's right to have uh, uh, this uh, uh, jihad? This, what they're trying to do is, you know, convert everybody to Islam or else you kill them. And uh, the other question was, uh, is uh, do you think it's right to do these suicide bombings? And country after country, there was a, a lot of them. Uh, the, the lowest country was like 30%, and the other countries were like 50%. So all over the Middle East, these countries like say are about 40% of the people are saying, yeah, I believe that we in, in this uh, – jihad that we need to kill everybody who doesn't become a Muslim. So the the number of people that are actually uh, uh, bad in Islam, I mean, to me, the, the real Muslims are the bad ones. Because if you study the Quran and the Hadiths, the bad Muslims that we see that are doing all these horrible things, they're the, those are the true Muslims. Those are the ones who are really following the teachings of the Quran and the Hadiths. The Muslims that we, we see in, uh, in other parts of the world, they're not necessarily like that. They're not really following the teachings of Islam. And we, we need to make sure that we get them the gospel because uh, we don't want them to die without hearing the gospel good news of Jesus Christ, because there's no doubt that in the Bible, uh, Scripture says the earth herself will spew those people out of her mouth. That's the way God designed it, and uh, it's going to happen. we got to get them the gospel before that happens. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on. i got a couple more verses to try to go here, and then I'm going to have to end this. It says in verse 12, he that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. Hmm. Well, that's pretty stupid, Commander. Let's look at it in the Amplified and see what it says. Uh, he who belittles and despises his neighbor lacks sense. But a man of understanding keeps silence. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't I don't go tell my neighbors anything when they throw their beer cans in my backyard. Okay? <laughs> I, I'm very nice to them and I tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ as often as I can. I don't come down on them for that other crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. There's a lot of things in Proverbs we're going to find out about keeping our mouths shut a lot more. And uh, uh, but this is the first one that uh, that uh, indicates that. Um, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. Uh, and in Am Amplified, um, it says, uh, "He who belittles and despises his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding keeps silent." Uh, keeping silent and not talking so much, uh, there, this is another one of these recurring themes uh, in, in Proverbs. Uh, that uh, there, there's, there's probably, I would say, uh, out of 31 chapters in Proverbs, uh, there's probably about you know, seven, eight, nine uh, basic themes that it continues going, repeating over and over and over again. And uh, uh, don't be lazy is one. Uh, 
don't be dishonest. Uh, don't hang out with the wrong people. Don't hang out with the, this uh, uh, strange woman. Uh, uh, all these things, these, these are recurring themes that uh, Solomon talks about over and over again. And now we see this idea about not being, don't be so quick to talk all the time. But sometimes it's best to remain silent. <laughs> You're going to find that we're going to find he has a lot more to say about that. Uh, so that's verse uh, 12. Let me make a note here. Um, I mean, Proverbs 11, verse 13 is where I'll pick up next time. <clears throat> Let me say this and final closing remarks here. I have to leave today because I have to meet my son for, for lunch somewhere. So I, I started a little early and have to leave a little early. But, uh, brother, uh, uh, let me ask you, uh, you know, this. we know that uh, wisdom uh, that we get from the Proverbs is so important in our lives. But uh, in, uh, I think, it's 2 Timothy, in Tim, uh, Paul said that uh, the uh, study, the wisdom under sal unto salvation is what we get from the scriptures. Wisdom unto salvation. The, the most wise thing, the first wise thing a person really must do or should do is know how to get saved, how to get salvation. And, you know, I've, I've, I've talked about it throughout this whole study today, but I, I haven't done an actual, like, an invitation. So let me ask you, would you like to tell the viewers uh, – who are maybe curious now, well, what do you mean? If, if I want to be saved, if I don't want to go into the lake of fire and perish, if I want to go to heaven and live forever with joy, uh, what do I have to do? Would you, could you tell the people what they have to do, what they must do so that they can have eternal life in heaven? Yes, I would love to, uh, Brother Luke. Uh, basically, uh, we can prove in scriptures that all you need to do is believe the gospel. And you'll be saved because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Uh, believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to scriptures and was buried and rose again on the third day according to scriptures. And uh, you can win the battle for your soul. Mm -hmm. Okay? And uh, Brother Luke will tell you more about that now. Yeah. I, I, I want to tell more, but I want to ask you to elaborate on a couple of points that you just said. One is, uh, we want the people, what they must do is they must believe that Jesus died for their sins. Why, why is that important for a person to understand and, and agree to, uh, that Jesus died for their sins? Well, uh, my lawyers could probably explain that better than I could. <laughs> <laughs> I just know it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the main thing is that the majority of people in the world um, don't understand biblical Christianity, and they think that Christianity and all religions are they're all really based on this idea that uh, we go to heaven based upon personal merit. Uh, if, we can, if we can do enough good things and stop doing bad things, the bad things are called sin, and the good things are called works. Good deeds are good works. So if we can do a lot more good works and a lot less sin and get this scale tilted in our favor, then uh, God will say you pass the test and the scale tilt in your favor and you get to go to heaven. Uh, but the problem is that um, the standard that, that God requires is perfection. So you have to have nothing but good and not one bad thing on the scale, and no one can do that. So... Uh, the problem is, is this sin. And when, if a person understands the gospel that Jesus died for our sins, in other words, sin's not, on, not an issue. You should jump for joy right now. If you're listening right now, you should be just giddy happy because Jesus paid for all your sins. Sin is not going to be the obstacle, the barrier between you and God. Jesus paid for your sins. Scripture says he died for our sins. Those who, that means those who believe, and, and also for the sins of the whole world. That means that even the people who didn't, didn't believe. Jesus died for everybody's sins. He paid for your sins. So you, the, what you need to understand first, according to the gospel, is 
Believe he died for your sins. Sin's not a problem now. He, thank him. He paid for your sins. Now you can go to heaven uh, and, and you can have eternal life. And the second part of the gospel is he was uh, died, he was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead. By raising himself from the dead, what he did was he kept a promise. He said, I'll give you a sign. I'll raise myself from the dead. And that proved that I have the power over life and death. So understanding the gospel is telling you two important things. He paid for your sins so, you can, so you're not going to be guilty. And you can have life because he has power over life and death. He'll, he, he, can raise, he raised himself from the dead, and he can give you life everlasting too. He's offering it to you. And the scriptures say that it's offered as a free gift. It's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, uh, For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest, uh, lest any man should boast. So uh, this eternal life is a gift that Jesus is offering you. He will, he will give you life everlasting. Uh, he raised himself from the dead. He proved he has power to do it. So now you can have confidence because of the resurrection. You can have confidence that he is able to give you life everlasting. And if he, the scriptures say that he promises us eternal life. And this scripture says that he never breaks his promise and he never lies. So you can be confident that Jesus has the ability to give you life everlasting and he will keep his promise. He's faithful. So that it's really as simple as uh, as Brother Eric said. Uh, believe the gospel. Uh, believe on the Lord Jesus. Rely on Him. Don't try to get to heaven through your own efforts. Give up on that, and instead, just put your hand, put yourself in completely in Jesus's hands, and trust Him. He'll get you to heaven, and that's the only way. Brother, you want to add anything to that before we we say goodbye? Absolutely not. You never add anything to the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Uh, I'm going to close the live broadcast, then I'll talk to you for a couple of minutes before I head out, okay? So um, everybody who's uh, watching, uh, uh, next Wednesday we'll pick up where we left off on Proverbs. And each Sunday uh, uh, we do character studies. So I'll be teaching on this next Sunday uh, uh, continuing teaching about uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob and his his sons, particularly uh, Joseph. Uh, so uh, thank you for watching, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.